dawn. And the city comes to life. Already early workers are on the move. It's a morning much like any other, and very soon, a day like any other. This is Aberdeen, the city of granite, whose harvests are from the sea. The fishing vessels, they come and they go. But for one of these vessels, this is not a day like any other. In a few hours from now, the Glen Struan of Aberdeen leaves on her maiden voyage. Her fishing tackle goes aboard. Lubricant and fuel are taken on. Supervised by the ship's husband, responsible for stores, the last of her somewhat domestic needs, for she'll be away three or four weeks, disappear below. Ice, 30 tons of it. And finally, the bait. Now the skipper, George Morris, arrives. A man bred to the sea, his father and grandfather skippers before him. They've come down to see their men away, or a new vessel off on her first voyage, a bit of both maybe. Not a drifter or a trawler, but a Great Line fishing vessel. A Great Liner, first of her kind in Aberdeen, specially designed for the job. So the Great Liner Glen Struan, all 183 tons of her, turns her nose to the north. Aye, our moment of glamour's over, and there are four days sailing ahead of us before we start fishing. Jimmy Buchan, served with the Navy in the Far East during the war. Alec Bruce, chief engineer, started in heron fishing when he was a lad of 13. John Mearns with a family of eight back in Aberdeen. Past Buchan Ness Lighthouse, off Peterhead, where the Glenstruan was built. Now, if you're looking for adventure, we aren't. A steady 11 knots and no trouble, that's all we want. George Scott, second engineer. He could tell you a story or two about Atlantic convoys. Now we're down to business. Time to get the tackle out. Bobby Tate, he's a family man too. Seven bairns biding time till he's back. Jackie Ritchie, the only bachelor aboard. Bill Anderson, the mate. He was with the army in 1940 and taken prisoner at Dunkirk. Bit of an escaper, Bill. Twice he broke out, and the third time he got clear of all him to Scotland. It's not a red carpet going down, but it's here we'll greet the halibut we're after in these northern waters.
dead ahead off Iceland. These are the Westman Isles. Another 200 miles beyond them is our objective. Now to get the tackle set up. Here's the hauler to pull in the line. The skipper and mate examine the white boys to be tied at each end of the line. To mark the boys, there's a sort of flagpole at each end, called the Dan, D-H-A-N. Time to get the bait up. It's heron, frozen stiff from the ice. Up in the wheelhouse, the skipper settled on a likely spot to shoot the line. You know, deciding where the fish are, man, it's a big responsibility. Now the first Dan and its boys, pallets we call them, go over the side. The mate signals Dan away, and the Dan floats off carrying one end of the line. And here's the line coming round the stern of the ship. The rest of it is coiled into 36 baskets. You see, in actual fact, there are 36 lines, all to be joined together to make the one line, 10 miles long. You need that length in this deep sea work. Aye, there's something of a swing about baiting the hooks and throwing them overboard. Meantime, we are moving slowly along as the hooks are baited and paid out. The line goes down anything from 150 to 350 fathoms, settling on the rough seabed where no nets could trawl. Now the last of the baskets and all the lines away. The anchor, or the sinker you might say, goes over followed by the second dan at this end of the line. Now a couple of hours to wait for the halibut to grab the bait. The skipper instructs the helmsman to bide by the second dan. And we've two hours to call our own. Outside, the Dan is waiting. Pallets are brought aboard and a line with them. Here they are, the big broad halibut, averaging anything up to 15 stone. That's over 200 pounds. And this happens too. Jimmy Buchan takes over from the mate at the hauler. And you'll see how the crew change jobs as the fish come in. <laughs> 
As the line comes in, Pim Morris, oldest man aboard, a veteran of the First War, prepares them for the next shoot. Redden the lines, we call it. Jackie Ritchie's spell at the hauler. We're here for halibut, but some queer fish come out. The livers will be rendered down for halibut liver oil. After hosing, the fish are packed below. Preserve them the chilling plant. Chilling only, they are not frozen. So it goes on, hour after hour, day after day. But the skipper has plans. He'll try another patch of water, away to the north again. And so for the crew, there's a wee while to rest and forget fish. By morning, we've sailed into a new world of ice. Keeping well clear of the bergs, for they can exert a powerful suction. Bottle-nosed whales. Youngsters frolicking in the Arctic water. And away there, the bleak shores of Greenland. On the intercom, the skipper gives us Rise and shine. Here's how Bobby Tate gets ready for the day. starts all over again. You know how the halibut got its name? Well, a butt meant a flatfish, and a halibut, or holibut, because it was eaten on holy days. By day and by night, too. An 
night, though, which seldom darkens, for this is the sea of the midnight sun. But now, the fish room down below, where the catch is stored, is filling up. Soon, the dams are hoisted for the last time. The Glenstruan, at this furthest point in her maiden voyage, starts for home. Well, we never promised you adventure on this trip, and thank God we had none. This was fishing as we wanted. holding on course at our steady 11 knots. Until 200 miles off the northernmost tip of Scotland, the skipper calls up the radio station at Wick to give his time of arrival at Aberdeen. Now for tidying up. And to starboard, the Scottish coast. The grey arm of the harbour stretches out for us at last. It's all over till the next time. All over except we must earn our keep in the market next morning. Along the quay, the boats are unloading. There go the Glenstruan's halibut to be laid out with the rest of the morning's landings. Seventeen appears of us. Seventeen, eighteen, eighteen, nineteen, nineteen, a pound, a pound, a guinea, twenty-one, twenty-one, two, twenty-two, twenty-three. Insistent, clamorous, that is the voice of Aberdeen, whose harvests are from the sea. Today, the Glenstruan, weather-beaten, sturdy, her maiden voyage behind her is one with the fleet which sets off, come rain, come shine, manned by the Jimmy Buckens, the George Scotts, the Bill Andersons and the rest, to bring in the harvest.